Welcome to the paradox of digital abundance, where the ease of duplicating digital files was meant to solve scarcity and lower manufacturing costs. That meant cheaper stuff, and cheaper stuff means we own more stuff, right? Then why does it feel like we're owning less and renting more? In this video, I'll explain how we got here and also offer a solution I've been personally working on. So let's get started. In 2016, the World Economic Forum published an essay by Danish politician Ida Uken. Uken. It was titled, Welcome to 2030, I Own Nothing, I Have No Privacy, and Life Has Never Been Better. The essay paints a whimsical little fantasy life in a nondescript city where people own nothing, not even the clothes on their backs. Instead, there are services for everything, which are provided by fairies and magical donkeys. I don't know, I didn't read it. I did, however, see the Economic World Forum's video summary of that essay, which gives eight predictions by 2030. The first prediction, you'll own nothing, and you'll be happy. When you're slapped, you'll take it and like it. The video predicts a future where ownership is over and we're all about that rental life. They also predict we won't eat as much meat. Uh, some stuff about climate change, carbon tax, and how the world will be run by just a few countries. Which ones? Eh, who knows? Guess that would have been nine predictions and they only had time for eight. So what is the World Economic Forum exactly? According to their mission statement, the World Economic Forum is the international organization for public-private cooperation. The forum engages the foremost political, business, cultural, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. And if those words ring with an eerie sense of foreboding, well done, you've passed the human test. The World Economic Forum was founded in 1971 by a futurist utopian named Klaus Schwab. Fun fact, his dad worked for the Nazis, who were pretty big on their own brand of utopian thinking. Oh, and occasionally he cosplays as a Star Trek villain. Yeah, totally normal. They boast over 1,000 partner companies and 100 governments in attendance, like a Coachella for billionaires and state heads. In the history of nothing to see here scenarios, this one is probably the most cartoonishly suspicious of them all. Fast forward to the pandemic and the World Economic Forum drafted a recovery plan called the Great Reset. When you label something great, history is shown as usually anything but. You know, Great Leap Forward, Great Depression, Great Purge, the Great Famine, Great White. And while Ida Ukin's You'll Own Nothing essay isn't officially part of the Great Reset, set playbook, it's suspiciously nestled in the key component section of its Wikipedia page for some reason. Maybe due to its thematic relevance, I don't know, but it's there. And here's what it says. By the scenario's 2030 endpoint, anything that had once been a product was now a freely available service, obviating any need for personal ownership of goods or real estate. When they say freely available services, let's assume they mean to rent our personal property or appliances and not expendables like detergent or food. Still, let me show you how impossible that would be. A cheap, basic fridge, brand new, costs somewhere between $600 to $700, which will run you about $45 a month to rent. After 15 months, the fridge would be paid for. All additional money after that is all profit for the rental company. Of course, rental services have their place. Sometimes they're essential, but let's be real. They're a now and then solution, not a forever and ever kind of deal. Owning is cheaper than renting in the long run. I mean, we can all agree that there are just some things that should be owned, right? Right? You won't only be shelling out $45 a month just to keep your milk cold in a rented fridge. You'd still need to rent everything else. Your washer, your dryer, bed, TV, home entertainment system, gaming console, toaster, furniture, rug, water air heater, purifier, fire, another one, one. Back, coffee maker, another one, pedal, waffle iron, another one. Another one. Another one. I mean, you'd be paying $10 here, $20 there, and occasionally 40 or 50 or even 100 every month. Aggregated, that adds up quickly. And quite literally, it is insane to suggest we rent all of that. And so far, we're only talking about the things inside your home and not the home itself. Remember, they're big ideas. You own nothing. This includes real estate. Let's be real. Currently, for many people, this isn't some distant dystopia. It's just another Tuesday. We know big investment firms like BlackRock, Vanguard Group, and State Street have been purchasing single-family homes from across the U.S., pricing a lot of people. Out. Housing prices have gone up roughly 130% since 2012. As of making this video, the median sales price for houses sold in the United States is at $417,700. Though this will vary state to state, with my state, California, nearly double that. Current median personal income as of making this video is $40,480. And that puts us somewhere in the ballpark of $37,000 after taxes, give or take, which also varies state to state. For a home at the median price of $417,700, financed for 30 years, with a 20% down payment and good luck saving up that 20% on $37,000 take home. But you're looking at a monthly mortgage payment just over $2,000. That's $24,000 a year for 30 years. Don't forget property tax, homeowner's insurance, and repairs. I don't think you'll have much of anything left to rent all those goods you've 
obviated any need for personal ownership of. But hey, there's an upside. You can save a few shekels renting instead. You know, that thing where you pay a portion of someone's mortgage and get none of the equity. You know, it's kind of like holding a charity for your landlord. But even philanthropists have to punch the clock so you'll need to lease a car to get to work. Because why own a car when this renting everything business sounds so good? And cars don't run on hopes and dreams, so you'll need gas and insurance. And while you live in that bougie life, don't forget you'll probably need to eat at some point during the year. <laughs> yeah, that's probably important unless the Klingon invented photosynthesis for humans. You'll own nothing. You'll rent everything. You'll be happy. The shift towards a renter's world is happening subtly yet steadily, one overpriced house at a time. This isn't just about our homes or our possessions, but about the control we're gradually ceding over our lives. If we don't start paying attention, we might just find ourselves truly owning nothing, not because we choose it, but because we didn't choose to stop it. You know, they say you don't buy it, you rent it. Huh? The thing. You really, uh... Uh, what do you keep? That's a sad commentary in and of itself. It's not just homes and fridges you won't own. It's the digital stuff, too. My software used to come on physical CDs. I'd buy it, own it, and proudly display it next to my AOL trial disks. In the late 2000s, tech titans like Microsoft started cooing sweet nothings about software subscriptions. I thought that'd never catch on. No one wanted to be nickel and dime for every piece of software keeping their workstations going. But they didn't need our buy-in. They just quietly pulled physical disks off the shelves and nudged everyone into subscription services like Office 365. Well, that sucks. This change wasn't just about convenience of cloud computing. It represented a significant shift away from ownership, one of many that affect physical things we once held in our hands, from books to movies and albums, all becoming more and more exclusively digital formats. Big whoop, right? Aren't the benefits of streaming sometimes better? Absolutely. And I love binging Netflix as much as the next serial procrastinator. It's not that subscription models are the villain here. It's the gradual disappearance of the option to own that is. And I'm going to get to why that's important. But first, let's amass the most cunning ruse ever pulled on hapless consumers. Consumers. The buy button. You see them on platforms like Kindle or Apple TV. You hit it thinking you're going to own that comic book or movie forever. Just like you do a Blu-ray or paperback, right? That's obviously what's being implied. It says buy right there on the screen, so obviously you're buying it to own, right? Nope. Because the moment they took away that copy you could hold in your hands, it was legally no longer yours to own. And this is likely why home release commercials switch from Own it today to buy Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny only on digital today. Their servers, their property. And if it's their property, what are you buying exactly? Short answer, a license they can revoke on a whim. And it's all right there in their terms of service. You did read it, right? Well, of course you did, because who doesn't have a spare five hours for a legalese binge read? Think they won't revoke your license? Oh, they'd get all up in that revocation, son. Warner Brothers deleted an entire TV series from digital libraries despite people buying it. PlayStation nearly deleted all 1,300 Discovery shows from people's collections until the internet lost its mind. My personal favorite is that time when Big Brother, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I mean Amazon snatched Orwell's 1984 off of the Kindle. <laughs> nice. Then there are the modifications. Roald Dahl's book got a modern makeover. Even music artists like Taylor Swift, Lizzo, and Beyonce are guilty of changing lyrics post-sell. So you're probably asking, is what they're doing legal? Well, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but yes, very. And it all revolves around this somewhat dusty but crucial legal concept called the first sale doctrine. This rule basically says that while you can't go around making bootleg copies of copyrighted work, you do have the right to do whatever you please with the physical copy you own. Sell it, lend it, gift it. The catch? This only applies to stuff you can hold in your hands. AKA, it doesn't protect digital purchases. For instance, when you buy something like a Blu-ray, you don't really own the movie itself. You own that shiny little disc of plastic. But that's significant, because no one can magically alter or yank it from your collection. Their server's their property. Your shelf, your property. But this isn't only about media. This impacts all digital purchases. Let me show you. Take a peek at current tech trends. Apple launched the Vision Pro recently, emphasizing spatial computing. Facebook became Meta, a shortening of the metaverse, with a sizable portion of their focus on virtual work. With more people working remotely, it's clear we're not just dipping our toes, we're diving headfirst into a digital workforce. And that means we're gonna need digital tools to do these jobs. Which brings me back to my personal experience buying and owning software CDs. That was then. Tomorrow, it's still a mystery what tools we'll need in this digital workforce. But one thing's for sure, under current laws, they won't belong to us, but they certainly should. It's mine because I bought it. <laughs> That's right. 
Take the plumber who buys a wrench. That wrench isn't just a tool, it's their bread and butter. They can use it, sell it, or even pass it on. They own it, no strings attached, because it's a physical, tangible thing. For the digital workforce, the laws will need to change to ensure digital tools are protected. Just like the plumber, digital professionals deserve to truly own the tools of their trade. Otherwise, we might as well start collecting screenshots of our subscription confirmations, framing them, and then hanging them next to those AOL trial discs, because that's the best we'll probably get. Now I'm depressed. And you worked on the original computer in this country, right? Yes. Now, wh how did you know so much about computers then? I didn't. How did I was you? the first one. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Grace Hopper was downright dope. Math genius, a professor, and a rear admiral. She has supercomputers and Navy destroyers named after her. She made computers talk more like us with some compiler magic. She was also irreverent and rebellious and popularized one of my favorite axioms. It is better to ask forgiveness than permission. This principle reminds me of that time when bird scooters sprang up overnight on the sidewalks of Los Angeles. They never asked the city for permission, they just did it. Initial reactions were a mix of eye rolling and pitchfork grabbing. They operated within a legal gray area, gambling on forgiveness over permission, and it paid off. And surprise, surprise, these scooters are now as much a part of the cityscape as traffic jams and movie billboards. Ah, progress. So why am I talking about Grace Hopper and bird scooters? Because I think a big piece of the solution to own nothing, rent everything, and be happy is in this little parable. I, is this a... Uh... It's a parable. Maybe not for the homes and physical goods, but definitely for digital content. So let me explain. Asking permission to own digital purchases won't work. There's no incentive for the IP owners to grant it. Why would they undermine new sales by allowing the resale of used digital content without pressure to do so? Equally, expecting lawmakers to update the first sale doctrine is also unrealistic. One, it'd take immense market pressures to convince Congress to change the law. It's all about that GDP. And two, and most importantly, they're technologically illiterate. Well, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. So it looks like you are overly using conservative news organizations on your news. And I'd like you to look into the overuse of conservative news organizations to put on liberal people's news on Google. And if you'd let me know about that, I'd appreciate it. Does TikTok access the home Wi-Fi network? Only if the user turns on the Wi-Fi. I'm sorry, I may not understand that. So if I have a TikTok app on my phone and my phone is on my home Wi-Fi network, does TikTok access that network? It will have to, to access the network to get connections to the internet, if, if that's the question. Okay, so asking permission is out. What alternatives are left? Some folks pine for a return to buying physical media, but let's face it, that ship has sailed, and probably on one of Hopper's destroyers. <laughs> The only solution left I can think of is for us to use current and emerging tech to protect ownership. So I've personally made that my mission. Armed with nearly three decades of professional experience in film and technology, my plan is to leave a better world for my son so his generation doesn't grow up with squat. Enter my solution, PERMA. A decentralized network for digital file distribution, closely paralleling how physical items are sold and owned. PERMA is an early development and under provisional patent. I'll dive into the techie mumbo jumbo in another video, tell you really how this thing works. But for now, here's how PERMA works in simple terms. Suppose I want to sell my super cool digital comic, Night Jackal number one. Just like deciding how many physical copies to print, I'd set an inventory for digital copies, which is then recorded on an immutable blockchain ledger. And I know when some hear blockchain, their crypto PTSD kicks in. But don't blame the technology because bad actors have exploited it. The tech is phenomenal in validating ownership, full stop. Now let's get back to how PERMA works. The encrypted comic file is then scattered across a really fast peer-to-peer -peer network. As buyers snap up these limited copies, transactions are permanently logged on that blockchain ledger. The network verifies ownership and boom, the comic is securely displayed for their eyes only. No centralized servers, no take backsies, no middleman. The buyer can then resell, gift, or even rent their digital copy. Duplicating the file is prevented using anti-piracy layers and IP owners can't reclaim or modify a sold copy. The gift of total ownership. This setup, inspired by the first sale doctrine, keeps both creators and buyers happy. Perma will be able to deliver any digital file type, comics, movies, music, virtual environments, AI models, essentially any type of data, but it won't be ready to handle all those overnight. Each would need their own custom API layer, which takes time and resources to build. We need to start small and build outwardly, one media type first, build a niche product as the testing ground for Perma's grander vision. Since I've already brought up comics, you can probably guess I already have a niche in mind. 
So let me introduce Ink Vault. Ink Vault's still in digital diapers with a whopping three comics at the moment, humble beginnings, but it has enough features to be dangerous. And the digital comics market is begging for a shakeup. Check out this ICV2 and Comicron's 2021 North American sales report. Over 2 billion in sales, only 8.2% of that is in digital. In the pandemic, when digital should have been everything, comic collectors were still elbow to elbow in the comic shop, snatching up physical copies instead. That stat right there is our smoking gun. It highlights a massive distrust in digital media ownership. That's why we'll be proving PERMA in the digital comic industry first. Enough said. Now here's the tie-in to Hopper's axiom. PERMA operates in a legal gray area. The first sale doctrine, not extending to digital sales, leaves PERMA without a clear legal safeguard. Despite plans for rigorous curation of the content going into PERMA, there's a risk of unauthorized material slipping past us. These are difficult to legally address due to our immutable file storage. Once an item is sold, it's irreversible by design. But if we get this right, imagine what PERMA could become. You enter your virtual workspace, armed with specialized software tools. You know when you need new tools, you can sell these used ones to help cover the cost. You own them, after all. After work, you check the digital movies you own and find a pleasant surprise. Your earnings for renting them out, not bad. Plus, that digital comic you own is now worth a little bit more than it was yesterday. Sell it, tempting. But you decide to savor the story one more time. Then it's off to the metaverse. You're meeting your friends for a dragon battle. Last time, you got roasted. This time, you borrow dragon-resistant armor from your bestie. Doesn't matter which headset you wear or which metaverse you enter, this armor goes with you. And after you defeat the dragon, you can return it like any borrowed property. Okay, okay, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. That's light years away. Still, you gotta admit, it's a future even this Klingon would approve of. Nanu! Nanu! Thanks for enduring my gravel voice. I just got over a respiratory virus, so appreciate that. If this video piqued your interest and you'd like to be a part of Shaping Perma, I need to hear from you. Please join our Discord server. Find me on X. Links are all below. I need your support. I'd love to hear from you. If you're an angel or could add value to our team, I'm looking for you as well. DM me on LinkedIn. Links all below. Uh, put Perma in the message so I know it's not spam. Uh, and if you want to know more about Nightjackal, the comic that I featured earlier, uh, it's an Ink Vault exclusive. Come check out our early beta at inkvault.io. As always, please comment, like, subscribe, but most importantly, share this video like digital wildfire. Let's rally the troops who share our renters' anxieties. Thank you and bye-bye. Uh, I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign A sign I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody